So I think the whole reason Sudas does this kind of a conference is to help give all of you new insights and inspirations to your own design explorations. And this idea that a place can be performative, um, I think, is a really important one. And today we saw lots of different ways in which performance has been illustrated or defined. Correct? We've seen that. Um, and a lot of it has focused on things that can be designed or introduced into the space that engages people so the people become the performance. And that is clearly one of the most important dimensions of a performative place. But there are also other dimensions that where the place itself performs. And uh, that might have been a little underrepresented today. Um, and although it was certainly represented to some degree, certainly in all the landscape examples where you see the landscape evolve over time, inevitably the place is performative. Uh, just take the intensity of the wildflowers in any of the landscape examples that were put there. Um, you know, they emerge, they do their thing, they die off and they come back again and there's a kind of ongoing performance and because, and this is one of Seeley's most important insights, because this wild flower event is put in an urban context, it suddenly has an intensity and new meaning, right? So that's a very, very important issue and obviously she showed that all the performances are perceived perceptually uh, through our senses and lots of times when a place performs in and stimulates senses that we normally don't pay attention to in the city, it also increases our awareness and intensity. Just look at the installation up at Louisiana where the sound of people walking on the, um, you know, on the gravel and the sound of the water, um, these, these sounds and the smell of the uh, water on the stones, suddenly those rooms are completely transformed, right? Uh, so I wanted to emphasize that. But finally, um, what I think was a little underrepresented is the idea that public space has a climate dimension it changes over the seasons um, and we can make design interventions that begin to, to alter that performance. Yeah. You know, perhaps expanding the comfort zone, uh, purposely making places of shade. We saw a lot of that illustrated in some of Seeley's things and in a lot of the other work. So I just encourage you to think about the dynamic performance of the place itself, not just although it's certainly the most important dimension, the, the human engagement as performance itself, that there are those two dimensions that you're trying to bring together. So it's just my observation. Any questions from the audience? Come on, I even know that uh, you, some of you are going to task to, yes, is a question there or we're just, yes? Okay, good. My question is um, on the aspect of light pollution. Um, uh, that's directed to you. Um, as a light designer, Mr. Kyle, uh, what, what um, could you please throw more light, pun intended, on that aspect? Do you have, let's, I think the light, light designer's uh, role in, in the building environment is to, to fight light pollution. As you saw in the example of Maria Toria, there were round globes that project the light you know, 
everywhere. And what we did is to, to actually stop the light going from to up in the sky and, and direct it more into the ground. So, so uh, we are creating awareness of, of to, to, to project the light where it should go. Um, so, so we are working uh, very hard as a profession to, to, to avoid uh, light pollution. There is a, a big, you know, uh, some certain places on earth have forbidden uplighting, for instance. Uh, the city of Barcelona during the day is filled with these, these trees, uh, parks with trees, and, and, and many of the light that are put in those beautiful parks are only directed downwards, which means that no trees are lit, which means that you don't see the trees because you're glared by the light that is underneath them which is uh, a pity because there is a beautiful you know, canopy of trees there that, is, that you're not allowed to lit uh, during night. So, so if you're also going to, to make laws against uplighting, uh, it's when you do lighting with, a, from a, you know, with not non awareness of the, the light angle, etc. So, so we are astronomers' best friends. Are there any of the speakers that have any questions from any of the other speakers? <laughs> Everybody's exhausted <laughs> after a long day and all these. Hey, we've got a question. Just a little. Okay, okay, it's, okay. It's, it's a simple question. Um, Elko uh, spoke about the importance of recession. And uh, it seems that many of the projects here uh, gain from recession. Yeah, it would be interesting to hear you comment on that. Recession. Anyone? Recession. One thing to, to, to start off is it because I th your introduction I thought was interesting because you kind of introduced the notion of um, the natural process as a kind of transformation. Uh, but I must say also, like the last speaker, I think we're talking about the same thing, it's to do with process. We're not talking so much about objects, we're not talking so much about the fixed master plans. So I think there's something um, uh, in, in common there. And, and, and I think the key question is, which also came across today, is how do you give that space? How, how do you give that political space? How do you let nature evolve? How do you let human beings evolve? Um, without having a clear end product, especially in a, in a political, I mean, really quite shocked when you talked about the politicians suddenly selling your building but the, the reality of the long-term approach also you said you know you don't need five years you need 25 years you know for ecology i need 25 years so we're talking about things running on a more process orientated way against the stream of short-term politics and and regulations and i think that's Although the stories look quite extremely different, I think that's a quite a common uh, determinator behind some of those stories. Can I just jump on that? Yes. I think the <laughs> other thing that um, all of the presentations triggered similar thinking, because if you look at uh, Peter Almond's presentation, uh, a traditional block and street pattern the only thing changed was the plot size in order to encourage um, small-scale um, entrepreneurial retail, right? Uh, so that's accepting the current model for how we build cities. Then you have lots of other propositions being put out here, like Rene Chow's where you are talking about field theory and a thick field that is more than just the street, it has penetration into the, what would have been traditionally a private realm and at multiple levels with public access to them. And if you can imagine then having some sort of landscape or natural agenda involved, you're talking about a very thick process as well and a very thick time frame. And the challenges for everybody here is who is going to finance that, who's going to maintain it, who's going to pay for it, and yet we saw in the last project, not to worry, you just get all the right people together and they'll build it and make it and take care of it. So I, I think, uh, what, what, am I, what am I saying, it's just that we need to be very creative 
about the institutional implications for uh, how we try to encourage a more procedural or process-oriented development. Yeah. I come to you. Yes. So you can speak. I can speak. Okay. No, I agree. I agree with the others. Uh, but uh, it is interesting to know that when we started in the 80s, you know, I was at school and we were taught there's no work, no future, and uh, there was a huge unemployment. And in these big buildings where we got together, everybody was unemployed. But after five, six, seven years, nobody was unemployed anymore because we, we could help each other and do projects together and work and one would be a known artist and we could all work with him, etc., etc. And even now, uh, there's again a crisis uh, in Amsterdam, a very bad day, the developers go bankrupt, etc., etc. Um, I I'd really want to show people that even if you are poor, you know, they're, 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 you can do something uh, yourself uh, like that and it's good to, to be a collective in that way when there is a crisis or when there is a lot of unemployment, that you can help and share each other to get out of it. So, for me, th it seems that we flourish when there is crisis and then we get driven out when there is this hochkonjunktur, this... Uh, and we flourish again. But uh, I also agree with the other speakers that it's also all about process and time and long-term uh, development. I think one of the things that happened in 2008 is that, um, except in, in Asia, I mean, maybe in the Middle East, the recognition that there weren't the large-scale resources anymore. Um, my scale is probably different because I was working in Asia but the, we all know that we have aging infrastructure and we can't actually afford to rebuild the entire infrastructure. So the notion of frameworks or district scale uh, supplements to what we already have in our larger regions, there's all sorts of scales of economies that we have to look at now, whether it's you know a parcel size, a building size, where the money sources come from, uh, the scale to which we want to interact. We recognize that we no longer can put a large sum of money and just clean things up. We, in the States, we can't rebuild our highways with the, inf with the monies that we had post-World War II. So there's different scales of economies that we're looking at. But we, what, I think what we all recognize is that it's not just endless supplies of money nor resources. I think there's a question over there, please. OK. Um, well, first of all, let me tell you I'm a little bit nervous, so if I screw up everything, <laughs> then uh, I hope you are understandable. Uh, well, my name is Jose Paredes, and uh, I study sustainable urban dynamics for the year. And um, <coughs> first of all, first of all, um, I want to thank you, the, the panel members, that very like really nice um, lectures. Especially, I liked uh, the first one. Um, it was uh, she, Han Shi Li, and uh, it was you, yeah. Han. Yeah. Han Chili, you? Yeah, yeah. I, I really liked it, enjoyed it, and then I also liked the one of the, um, which one was it? Yeah, I'm screwing up now, as you <laughs> know. <this. laughs> and uh, and then I liked, uh, I especially enjoyed uh, um, Eva's and um, and uh, the one from Berkeley, the first one. Who was it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I really enjoyed them. And well, actually. Um, I, I'm, I'm very engaged in this urban discussion. Uh, I, re I really think it's like really, really important because like it's the most important thing. Like we need to make our cities livable. And um, well, like this summer I read a book, and um, or, like I feel a little bit that I'm, that I'm doing advertising for this book. But when I read um, like the, the 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 titles and like the universities of the members, I saw that some of you were from Berkeley, and uh, like. Um, uh, like I have had, th I have this need of like finding some theories or like some analysis of analysis of what makes our cities livable. And uh, I actually like read this book uh, of a guy called Christopher Alexander. And uh, I, I suppose that some of you know know like these thoughts because uh, he's from Berkeley. And uh, like uh, I feel like I'm really really nervous actually because uh, <laughs> because like when I read this book, everything was like anti-architecture and it it like. Uh, uh, it was like a way of uh, um, 
analyzing cities to make them really livable and make, make them like really human. And like, unfortunately, I think that most suburban design nowadays is very unhumane because like lots of materials are hard. Like uh, community is never involved. So that's why I was really glad to to hear about uh, Eva and um, especially like. Uh, you, you're um, the one about the patterns that you talked about that you do, that you analyzed in the city and like actually this guy like Christopher Alexander his book is called like a pattern language and he lots of lots of it is about finding languages and actually I have it with me here <laughs> and I, I would just like to recommend you like uh, I don't know when I read this book I was like oh my god this is like everyone should read it and it's and it's the thing is that it's written also like 30 years ago in the 80s and I was like um, um, yeah, I don't know. So I was wondering, yeah, my, my question was, sorry, it's like if there's any theoretical background to, to like these new par paradigms that seem to be arising, like the one the, the economist from, L, from K KTH um, was talking about, I don't remember his name. So he was talking about like the small plots and I mean, it's, I suppose there's maybe some guys or like people or women that have also like theorized about it. And I have like this, I, I, dis I discovered this book and so I was like really, uh, um, I was really happy. And um, yeah, I mean, I've seen like Matthias Scherchrom, he was also like um, uh, trying to analyze this and like showing us up like all this theoretical structure. But I thought it was like, maybe it's not that hard and maybe there's more simple ways of, uh, of experiencing it. And when I, and this ideas of this guy called Christopher Alexander, I was really like, oh my God, this guy said it's really clear and everything is simple. And I mean, we people, we're not that like complex and like, Everything's pretty straightforward. And another thing is that uh, I also like get nervous because I know that this guy, Christopher Alexander, I think that some people hate him because he's like against architects and he says like, there shouldn't be architects, like people should design for themselves and like, and well, I mean, it's not as, e as simple as, it's, as it sounds because like, we live in an industrial society and uh, like, like the conditions to make livable cities, I think uh, go sometimes against like this industrial uh, society. But that was, I, I thought it was like, uh, uh, well, I read that book, so I was like, oh my god, I need to talk about it. So I just wonder, for the guys at Berkeley, maybe, because I have never, as I had never heard these ideas, and maybe I would like to know if there's been some criticism, or maybe what you guys think and stuff. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sorry. observation is that uh, it all goes back to the 60s. I mean, you talk about Christopher Alexander, we talked about Jane Jacobs, uh, we talked about uh, Constant and uh, New Babylon. Um, so I, I see definitely a move. Uh, kind of time lapse of 50 years, and that's, uh, that's not a criticism at all. I think it's very interesting, but there's no doubt this, 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 uh, even the way of uh, art and engagement and in you know, uh, landscape architecture. My profession, uh, maybe you worked with him at the Halprin, uh, you know, his events. It, it's um, it's a revival as well as an as a renewal, um, and I don't think that's something to be ashamed about. I think we have to know our own history. The famous book, uh, Design Without Architects. Uh, all this, yeah. it's of course very relevant for our current debate. However, I also thought we, we also learn lessons. Like I was very inspired how uh, business like you also were. You know, it's, so it's not just only being dreaming, it's also doing action. And the same with ecology. I think we understand ecology much better now than we did in the 60s. So I think we're moving forward, but it's definitely a um, revival of, uh, of the 60s. So uh, get out those trousers and those records <laughs> and uh, relift the 60s. May I come out yes. of that? Uh, Am I on? Yes. Yeah. Nice. There was, you know, social engineering is not popular anymore. Uh, the modernist failure to that. But there was a very interesting collaboration in the 60s between psychologists, uh, sociologists, anthropologists, and architects. They were collaborating in this social engineering. They had a strange idea of creating a new kind of human or a new kind of society that destroys the whole project. But the collaboration was a good thing. That ended with the failure of modernism. And we got architects that became artists and town planners that became process people or whatever. We get a lot of new silos. But we, what we are seeing today with this new economy that we have to go back to this multidisciplinary analysis of the city, which uh, Christopher Alexander and Jan Jacobs actually was into. And now we have all those small firms that Jane Jacobs uh, analyzed. They're coming back. So I think sh her analysis in one way is more and more uh, relevant. And when I get a mic, I can continue. Uh, another word that popped up here was politics. What we see now is 
we see there's more and more a shift from objects to places, obviously. We have a greater interest of places. And with these strong urbanizations, we also have more and more uh, scarcity or competition about places. We will have more conflicts in places because of that. And as I told you before, small firms, entrepreneurs, are more political people than larger firms. So I think we are going into an era where everything gets more and more political. You will, you will, you young students, you will have a new scenario uh, when it comes to architecture. It will be much more political and much more integrated with other disciplines. But may, many of you will end up in large firms, and you maybe have to fight all those nice activists like Eva <laughs> in the future. No, See, so you maybe <laughs> she'll think twice. Yeah, just a reflection. I think everything goes absolutely in cycles, and maybe not even 50 years, maybe just 30 years, or even less. So they're coming back. So it's kind of good to see that you actually have reinvented a book that maybe has been sleeping for a while and then come back again. So I think to try to take the best of what is out there is really <coughs> your position that you actually can learn from what has been said before or actually what they have been testing out. But on the other end, as students, it's really the most important is that you do it your own way. And I mean, then you can pick from a lot of, of uh, the, what the speakers <coughs> have been saying. And if you really need a theory to go, go with it. I mean, please do, that's, that's perfect. But I really think that the notion of interdisciplinarity, or I really like to call it transdisciplinary, because really, really have to think both under and underneath and beside, and we have to change roles much more. So I think just to be an architect can't solve everything. And I think it's really important to work in teams to try to see the big organism that actually uh, the urban society has to move on. So really just be in the architecture bubble. I think it's really good to go in the cloud and try to then interact with others. So I think that's a really important issue that don't be th too narrow sight when you start uh, thinking of how you can do the urban uh, evolvement and environment and to really challenge that. <coughs> yes, please. Oh, you have to get it back. Just a comment on that. I, I think you said something very important. Um, after working almost 25 years, I have seen, I have been, you know, talking conferences for, for lighting designers and lighting communities since the beginning. And, and uh, it's here I should be, you know, talking with architects and start to architect students. And, and you should not go to architectural uh, uh, conferences. You should go to political conferences, lighting design conventions, engineering uh, conventions, etc. So you are cross, you know, we have the cross thing uh, to learn from, from others. This is a tip for me. And another tip I would say is to, um, to do, uh, you know, combine your work with an interest. For instance, for me to be able to work with the lighting scheme in a ski resort was like the dream, dream world. And I realized that, hey, I, I can actually do that. You know, be part, of, you should have a dream. You know, if you're paragliding or whatever, you should do design within paragliding society. It's to combine your personal interest and your profession, then it, one plus one becomes three or even four. So that's a tip. That's it. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so. <laughs> I suppose we need to respond to the Christopher Alexander thing. <laughs> Directly from Berkeley. <laughs> Directly from Berkeley. So, uh, I'm, it's ter you're bringing it up reminds me of the T.S. Eliot quote from his quartet about, you know, wandering and coming back again, and it's only when you come back again you really know something again to anew, which is what's happening now with a lot of these things. Um, and I taught, uh, you know, I've been at this a long time, I taught the pattern language when I was teaching at Princeton. Um, so I know the book really well. And it is, 
um, a wonderful uh, process of exploration. The really interesting question becomes whose pattern language? And um, I always thought it had been offered to all of us to decide whose pattern language it was. But I found in Christopher Alexander's case that he had a lot of possession about it and was not particularly open mm. to other ideas about what the pattern language was, which was a kind of inconsistency. But it's a really um, interesting and important process to look at and to try to understand for today. Um, I want to add one more thing. It's really simple about process. So um, maybe it's just me, but one of the things I loved in um, Katerina's and Cyril's presentation was the little diagram that showed how they took the palette and cut it up and made it fold into a folding landscape. Now, why did I like that? Because when you saw it as the folded lang uh, landscape, you intuited the process of how it was made. So suddenly, the idea wasn't just, oh, dumb pallets. It was, look, there's a whole process that has transformed the palette into something useful. So I'd also say, that when we're talking about performance, the object itself uh, or the space itself can show, even though it's not moving at the moment, it can imply and show the process that made it. And then in a way, its performance is embedded there, even though it's there statically. So I really urge you, when you're thinking about design, that um, the process of thought and the process of making can be performance as well. So it's not just performance of the people who engage. It's not just the actual performance of the space, like lighting or water or whatever other things. It's that the object can have an embedded performance in it. So I think. And suddenly, it's much more interesting. <laughs> so that's why I love those little pallets, because I could <laughs> imagine how they got made. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> well, Harrison, I just I think what you just said is extremely important and something we didn't talk about enough, really, which is that <clears throat> one of the things that people get out of an attention to architecture or to urban design or to nature um, uh, or landscape uh, is the chance to trace some actions that have been taken by somebody else and to see the intelligence that has gone into that and to find that intelligence inspiring and instructive. Uh, that's a hugely important aspect of what we need to have our environments make possible. And it's something you need to pay attention to in, <clears throat> in making your own work. Um, and then I, I was just going to append uh, and reinforce again something Harrison said. I, I was at Berkeley even before he, and in fact was a close colleague of Christopher's. Um, uh, the, the, what, what, and the only reason I want to contend, or not contend, but extend what was said, is that the real vision of that book originally was that it was a way of taking the environment apart into pieces, into units, and comprehensible little uh, parts of, an, of a place that people interacted with. And then to have a number of people collect their observations about that, uh, and then for that to become something that other people could refer to. It was meant to be a kind of building up of a big knowledge bank about what kinds of spaces there were and how people responded to them. And that's still possible for you people to do with each other. Uh, and the, the problem with the, with, with, that came with that book is it became codified into this is the way to do it. That wasn't the original intention and it's not the way you need to think about it. Uh, you can use that book as a basis for 
yourselves in groups making observations about things and debating them and clarifying them and making them a part of what's uh, available to you. That's what Renee said. Make patterns. Look for yeah. patterns. So I'm going to add one more piece yes. as the last Berkeley person. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, um, I had read pattern language like you did. I discovered it and it was exciting. Um, it wasn't until I moved to Berkeley that I recognized that Chris had made it his language, but in reality, when I read the patterns again, I recognized that he was describing the Berkeley Hills. And so I welcome you to come visit us in Berkeley, and you can actually see that it's a language that dissects the Berkeley Hills. And Donlin's exactly right, that you can do it for other places, but they won't be exactly the same patterns. I think we all have been in the pattern period. And <laughs> if you haven't been there yet, you probably will come. There will come a day. But I think it uh, looks like maybe no more questions. Ah, another question. Oh, two more questions. Yes. Oh, no, it's <laughs> uh, microphone, yeah, good. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Robert Johnson. I'm studying here at school as well. Uh, first of all, great job with the question. Was, uh, that was... Uh, it was nice. Let's give him an applause. That was a great yeah. performance. <laughs> <laughs> and my question is uh, about politics. You guys have been talking a bit about it today, but uh, in Eva's case and in the case in Prague, it was a great way of tackling bureaucracy, I guess. So that's maybe a good question from all of us young architects. How do we tackle politicians and how do we get funding? and and th if you could talk a bit about that, that would be really good, I think, for all of us. <laughs> Should I answer that one? Oh, is it for me? Oh, it's for me. I had a, I, I had a really tough time working with politicians. And uh, they're so unreliable. They change every few years. They're on short-term little success. They don't care about the long-term development. So I've decided I'm never going to work with the government. They're going to beg me to work with me. And that's what's happening now. And that's great. <laughs> and really, you know, just... You, or when you start working, <laughs> the government make a legal contract or something that you're... But even that doesn't work. It's, but really, let them beg you to work with you. And uh, I d it, it will not answer your question, but probably you first have to experience the whole political system. And maybe you're lucky. We were lucky at the right time, the right person in the beginning, then after a few years it was the wrong person. And so it's all luck. And, and also we have to deal with the politics too. I have to learn the language. So it's not only their fault, it's also our fault that we don't uh, understand what's, what their uh, responsibility is or their vision. But uh, I feel really proud that now with the energy company, they're begging to do everything for us. And uh, we don't need them, we don't need their money, nothing, we could do it all by ourselves. But okay. that's 20 years of experience. Maybe you have a comment? Yeah, I was just gonna... Yeah, yeah. I was just gonna say that, uh, of course, we had to deal with uh, the municipality as the, as the politics, but um, then you just have to go for it. Or what we did, you know, we are young, so we just gonna, you know, the re revolutionary way, gonna do it and deal with it afterwards, you know, whatever comes. <laughs> but uh, I think this, uh, when you, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what your experience was uh, with that, but may maybe in the future we'll have to take a different approach, and I think we will learn how to do it, hopefully. Uh, it's great if you just do short projects, then you're always successful yeah. with the government, yeah. or at maybe four years, the max. That's great. <laughs> maybe just a short tip. In our case, it was much easier because we were students, and when we came to the municipality and we said we had this intention, they gave us the permit for free. We didn't have to pay anything, and they were glad that we are doing something on the site. So maybe that's kind of something that could encourage you to get involved, because you're young and you have the power. And if you smile a lot, they will do whatever you want. <laughs> I suppose I don't know. Nice, nice ending there, almost. But, but uh, I, I, I have a, you know, politicians. Um, I think uh, dialogue is, is a good way uh, to talk with them. Uh, politicians need people with ideas. They need inspiration. They need people who know more than them. They don't know. They're not, not specialists. So they need people to tell them 
what they should talk about. And if you're persistent and if you're open to dialogue and you find find the right pol politic, everything is possible. So I'm I, I met a couple of politicians uh, recent t recent months and and uh, I have a positive you know. Especially in elect election times, you should grab them just a couple of months before the election and, and give them good ideas and all of a sudden you hear them t t telling you your words. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, they're, they're actually, they're humans, you know, politics. <laughs> and and, and uh, they're made of everything as you are. So, so they have feelings as well. So, uh, you know, you should, they're not monsters. That's what I'm t t telling you. So, um, if you look at the programs for this, this conference over the last um, nine years, you'll find a lot of the presenters have entered into alternate practices, where, whether they're running nonprofit urban labs or, you know, special nonprofit groups or running um, art, arts organizations. Um, what they've decided to do is take that route of a non-traditional practice in order to generate ideas that might be slightly um, unorthodox or um, you know challenging the current status quo but then they back up the ideas with good evidence and argument and they take it to the politicians and the politicians are ready for it so uh, there's a tremendous amount of activity of what could be described as sort of rogue practices. We even have the Sudas Urban Lab that um, is challenging how municipalities normally conduct their business and showing them things that they're not seeing. So you can do that. That's how to deal with politicians. Um, and you've seen examples of it today. They want ideas, but you need to have the ideas and the evidence and the argument that gives them um, reasons for following what you're doing. So that means you have to do your homework. And that's why when you do your thesis, you should plan to take your thesis back to your municipality as a gift for them to learn something about your place. A lot of our students have done that. And I think you, you really need to be patient and stubborn. Okay, there's one more question. Hello. Um, I feel like uh, we have heard a lot of ways to affect the development of our cities. Uh, but I have, some, I have a question about uh, money or the way money affects the development of our cities. I feel like... Uh, uh, I, well, I'm from, I'm from Oslo, from the School of Architecture in Oslo. I'm on an exchange. And uh, two, of, two of my old teachers, they um, constantly try to impress upon us the importance of uh, affecting the people with money or, uh, or taking an active part in the development of big uh, finance-driven projects in order to affect the outcome of these projects in a good way. And I, uh, I guess I, I, I haven't got like a pointed question to any one of you, but uh, I'm interested in what room do you think there is for us to affect not necessarily the politicians or, or do bottom-up projects, but is there a room for us to affect the um, development of our, of our cities through the uh, way of the capital? Or I don't know if I <laughs> made myself clear. Through... Um, Working with big firms or with the with the, the with the money. How am I going to earn a living? You're asking. Yeah. <laughs> no, not. I, I, I feel like I feel like <laughs> sometimes architects can can be uh, can sort of cut themselves out of the development by by siding against uh, profit. I don't know if maybe you disagree, but uh, at least I think that's the th the general theme. I think is very interesting. Maybe you could comment on it. Well, I personally, I believe, um, like the projects I'm involved in, we initiate projects, so we do a lot of voluntary work, and we see that as an investment in ourselves. Even if I didn't have work, or if I wouldn't have work, I would look at people that I admire 
and volunteer to work with them to get experience from it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what I thought for our bottom-up projects, it's important to have this commitment. And also, I've worked a lot with architects. They're not very good in calculating. Some old ones are, but the new ones aren't. So, is your plan feasible? Is it going to work? Because if it's not going, if it's not feasible, it's not going to work. Nobody's going to pay attention towards it. So there must be some way of feasibility and some way of commitment. It doesn't have to be much. Um, but that's my own answer to your question. small private practice. I think I can speak probably only five years ago, most of my jobs were government jobs, uh, and ultimately the politicians were the paymasters. Uh, and I'm doing public space, public parks, public uh, plazas, uh, townscape. And now nearly all my clients are private, and still delivering similar jobs, parks, public space. Um, and, and yes, it's the funny thing is that you become a commodity. So in fact, you work, you crazy the idea, become a commodity for developers in order to generate new markets. I think it's a very complex question. I mean, we, we cannot uh, avoid to, uh, to think about it. But yes, I have some uh, also very enlightened clients. And one, I got one client, he's probably one of the richest persons on the planet right now. And he really puts his money where his mouth is. And actually, I can do things with him in terms of creating botanical experiences, which I could never have done in any other case. And, you know, sometimes it's quite nice to play with somebody's money uh, trying to do something for the public good. So it's not something to... Um, I think we, if we are creative and intelligent and always socially aware, then we should play with it. You know, we, yeah, we have to have an element of, you know, maybe we can also do it that way, if, as long as we have the common interest in it. Because we, we cannot be ourselves become like... Uh, the play ball for developers doing uh, on, on e uh, adequate things. But to, uh, to create some beauty is a nice ambition. I think Kai would to say something. I just have a tip for you is to, to go to a, a conference called Business Arena. That was last year, uh, last week in Stockholm. It will be in Malmö uh, and, and Umeå. Uh, it's an arena for developers politicians and architects and all everybody who's in the built environment that they are discussing things together and there you have uh, everybody's involved there in the, the, these kind of discussions so that's a tip for you to to to, to go so this is a real problem in the US uh, and the problem is that our cities are more or less bankrupt. And so they have stopped investing significantly in the public realm. And that means that private organizations are asked to build and maintain these things, um, or neighborhood organizations. So it's a real challenge as the public realm becomes more privatized and controlled by developers. And it's very worrisome for them from um, the perspective of making a really wonderfully um, democratic public society. The other thing is that um, you heard s some comments about developers have a very short-term uh, look at things. They want to get something financed. They want to invest as little as they can in it. Uh, get it financed and they want to sell it as quickly as possible and make their profit. Um, and it can be a pretty, they see the physical environment as a product, not as necessarily, you know, they see it more as a product and they think the market wants this product or not that product. The whole process is also developed, is extremely influenced by what banks will finance or not finance. So this is a field that requires a tremendous amount of discussion um, because each of these contexts are very different. Uh, the Swedish economy and municipality financing is very different than the US. Developers are pretty much the same, I think, um, unless you have a developer who wants to own and operate uh, their 
thing. Then they have a long-term window. We've seen the best example of that in a ground-up operation because they wanted to own and operate their, their thing. So each one of these contexts is very, very different, and it's a complicated and really important question. Um, because it, it yeah. could be another <laughs> conference. You, you know, uh, finance makes form, something like that. <laughs> Um, but it's also an area that um, is underdeveloped. You have to go to the developer conferences like the Urban Land Institute. Every time I go, I feel like I, it's a different language almost. Um, but it's really important. And um, I think a, a discussion that should be more widely had in our democratic societies about where we invest our public money. And, and where we create incentives. I totally agree. It's really a complex question. And I think it could be absolutely not just one another conference, but more. Yeah. And I think it's evolving all the time. It's all about process. But I think we have to wrap up for today. So it's really ending the day. And I really hope that everybody really reflects about what we have heard today and keep the discussions going. And it's really good that if you disagree, so, but just then make your voice and raise your voice and see how you can use it in your projects and have a discussion with other students. Come over to the speakers. There now is a mingle that will start out in uh, the white carpet again and go into the cloud and you know, the sky is the limit. Even if there are clouds, just keep on going. So thank you for the Sudis team. Thanks to all the speakers. Thanks for coming. Okay, a big applaud. <laughs>